we end up our lecture with a definition, definition of super singular or super, uh, super singular or ordinary curve. So basically, if you have uh, here the set of elliptic curves defined over some algebraically closed field, you can always uh, like divide them into different sets. So the sets of ordinary elliptic curves and the set of a super singular. So an elliptic curve is either ordinary or super singular. Okay? So and when you consider maps isogenous between elliptic curves, do ac you actually stay in the same set because uh, we have that uh, uh, the following thing all through. So let phi be an isogeny from E1 to E2 be an isogeny. Then E1 is super singular if and only if E2 is super singular. Okay, and in the same way, E1 is ordinary if and only if E2 is ordinary. Okay, so we cannot have isogenies between an ordinary curve and a super single elliptic curve. Both have to, be, have to be super singular or both have to be ordinary, okay? So now let's start a little bit talking about isogeny-based cryptography. So isogeny-based cryptography actually begins with ordinary elliptic curves. So begins with ordinary elliptic curves. Okay? And uh, the first proposal that we can consider as an isogeny based crypto system is this one. So this is the paper, like you, cryptography. So the author is Jean-Marc Couvain, a French mathematician. And uh, actually this note was written in 1996. So we are in 1996, seven, sorry, 1997. The note is published, note was published in 2006, okay? And uh, basically, Kuven introduced the notion of hard homogeneous spaces and described the key exchange based on this, okay? And uh, it, made several, it made an example of hard homogeneous spaces, and this was built using ordinary elliptic curves and isogenies. So, well, what, you know, I cannot uh, go much deeper in the details of uh, how this is uh, built, but for reference, if you're interested, this, is, this can be con considered the first proposal isogeny-based crypto system. So here we can write that Kuven introduced, so introduce, introduces the notion of hard homogeneous spaces Hard 
hard homogeneous space and describes a key exchange based on it. Okay? So, as, uh, as hard homogeneous spaces, space, he proposes So let's say that the, the hard homogeneous spaces he proposes is based on ordinary elliptic curves and the complex multiplication theory. So this is a beautiful theory which is, uh, we, can we, we can describe for any elliptic curves. And again, we don't have time to, to do this here, and it's more advanced, but there are also, also several protocols now that are based on this. So if you're interested at some point about this, you can look for some references in com about complex of, um, multiplication, multiplication theory. And then later, so here we are in 2004, so you saw the note was published in 2006, uh, so in 2004, this was uh, rediscovered in uh, Stolbunov's master thesis. They discovered the same idea, but now, you know, we see also the title of this paper is more related to isogenies and uh, cryptography. And I think it is uh, the first paper where they mention crypto systems based on isogenies. So basically, this is the same. Uh, idea uh, that was rediscovered by these two mathematicians. So I'll write it just in case you have some comments here. So 2004, and actually the, uh, this was published on ePrint on 2006. So in uh, uh, these two authors, Rostov and Stolbunov, independently, independently rediscover Kuven idea. Okay. And now we go to 2006. So you see, so far we were using ordinary elliptic curves. In 2006, we have the first protocol who uses super singular elliptic curves, and actually what we are going to describe today, super singular isogeny graphs, okay? So this is a paper by Charles, Goren, and Lothar. It's about hash function, so one of the application proposed was the hash function. We will see that this protocol is actually, actually this is, I think, it's the only one that we will see together. It is broken, so you may understand why we do this. But actually, it allows us to understand also some of the problems in isogeny based cryptography. Okay? So we are in 2006, and uh, we can see 2006. So Charles, Goren, and Lothar propose a hash function. which is called CGL hash function. 
which is based on super single isogeny graph. Okay. And the, the end of ordinary elliptic curves basically uh, can be dated to 2010 when these three uh, researchers, Child, Zhao, and Sukarev, ah, sorry, actually this note was written in 1996. So we are in 1996, seven, sorry, 1997. The note is published, note was published in 2006. Okay, and uh, basically, Kuven introduced the notion of hard homogeneous spaces and described the key exchange based on this. Okay, and uh, it made several. It made an example of hard homogeneous spaces, and this was built using ordinary elliptic curves and isogenies. So, well. What, you know, I cannot uh, go much deeper in the details of uh, how this is uh, built, but for reference, if you're interested, this, is, this can be con considered the first proposal isogeny based crypto system. So here we can write that Kuvenia introduced, so introduced, introduces the notion of hard homogeneous spaces hard homogeneous space and describes a key exchange based on it. Okay, so as, uh, as hard homogeneous spaces, space, he proposes, so let's say that the, the hard homogeneous spaces he proposes is based on ordinary elliptic curves and the complex multiplication theory. Theory, which is uh, we can we, we can describe for any elliptic curves, and again we don't have time to to do this here, and it's more advanced. But there are also also several protocols now that are based on this. So if you're interested at some point about this, you can look for some references in com about complex um, multiplication multiplication theory, and then later. So here we are in 2004. So you saw the note was published in 2006. Uh, so in 2004, this was rediscovered in uh, Stolbunov's master thesis. They discovered the same idea, but now you know we see also the title of this paper is more related to isogenies and uh, cryptography. And I think it is uh, the first paper where they mention crypto systems based on isogenies. So basically, this is the same uh, idea uh, that was rediscovered by these two mathematicians. So I'll write it just in case you have some comments here. So 2004, and actually the, uh, this was published on ePrint on 2006. 
So in uh, uh, these two authors, Ro Rostov and Stolbunov, independently in the independently rediscover Kuven idea. Okay. And now we go to 2006. So you see, so far we were using ordinary elliptic curves. In 2006, we have the first protocol who uses supersingular elliptic curves and actually what we are going to describe today, supersingular isogeny graphs. Okay? So this is a paper by Charles, Goren, and Lothar. It's about hash functions. So one of the applications proposed was hash function. We will see that this protocol is actually, actually this is, I think it's the only one that we will see together. It is broken, so you may understand why we do this. But actually, it allows us to understand also some of the problems in asogeny-based cryptography. Okay? So we are in 2006, and uh, we can see 2006. So Charles, Goren, and Lothar propose a hash function. which is called CGL hash function, which is based on super singular isogeny graph. Okay. And the, the end of ordinary elliptic curves basically uh, can be dated to 2010 when these three uh, researchers, Childs, Zhao, and Sukarev, ah, sorry, basically show the breaking the, well, we have to be patient a little bit, Breaking the scheme proposed by Kuven, Rostov, Seven, Stalbonov amounts to solving an instance of the abelian hidden shift problem. Okay? Maybe you don't know what it did, but it, is, it was actually known a quantum, a sub exponential quantum algorithm for this problem. And so they write in their abstract, this result suggests that isogeny based cryptosystems may be uncompetitive with more mainstream quantum resistant cryptosystems, such as lattice-based cryptosystem. But they were talking just about ordinary elliptic curves, okay? So let's just write this. So we are in 2010. Child. Child. Zhao and Sukarev eh, okay, show, well, um, show that breaking the we can uh, abbreviate this by CRS scheme, amounts to solving an instance of the abelian hidden shift problem 
for which sub exponential quantum algorithm quantum algorithms exist okay so sub exponential is not really breaking it but it means that the security is not really good as much as we want, okay? And so what we're going to do now, first of all, we, I can tell you that since 2006, basically all the protocols based on isogeny use super singularity curves, and we are going to understand what is good about super singularity curves, and uh, we're going to start with, uh, and maybe we will have only the time to do this one, the CGLS function, and as I told you, we are going, for, for doing this, we have to define what is a super singular isogeny graph. Okay, so this is what we are going to do next. Any questions so far? So you will see that uh, these super singular isogeny graphs, they are geometric objects so because we are going to define the vertices, the edges, and uh, uh, so it will be very interesting to understand how they can use actually for building protocols. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> again, both protocols that relied really on this were broken, but I think it is important to, when somebody, you know, uh, works in isogeny based cryptography, they should know about this kind of object. So first of all, I will show you how does a super singular isogeny graph look like. Ah, no, first of all, sorry. First of all, who introduces super singular isogeny graph? You see here, we are much before uh, 2006. We are in 1986. So this is a paper in French because Max uh, is a French mathematician. And, uh, you know, the language here is very different for what, you know, we use nowadays for super singular isogeny graph. But this is considered the fence for uh, this kind of objects. And uh, some years later, in 1990, this uh, uh, Pizer, I think it is pronounced, showed that uh, super singular isogeny graphs are Ramanujan graph. And this is actually very important for cryptography. We will understand why. Again, also this paper, you won't recognize in it super singular isogeny graph because in a total, it is in a total totally different language, the language of quaternion algebras. But actually, super singular elliptic curves and quaternion algebras, they are very much connected, okay? Anyway, how does it look like a super singular isogeny graph? It is something like this. I don't know if you can really saw the, the edges, but I think the vertices at least is clear. So this is something that we are going to understand now. You see, we have two primes here, P, 227, L is equal to, and then we have different vertices. Some of them, they are, I, I made it pink, okay? And some others, they are, they are uh, uh, blue. We understand the difference, and we are going to understand what are these edges, okay? So let's do, let's start with super singular isogeny graphs. Okay, so we take P and L, two prime numbers. With P different from L. Okay, and you have to imagine also always that in the applications, so in applications, our prime P is very large, okay? This means that it has uh, like uh, more than no, hundreds of bits, hundreds of bits. While L, like you can see, is small, okay? L is small. Is actually L equal to three 
are anyway something uh, like uh, among the first primes. So let us now define what is. Uh, so the super singular, super singular L isogeny graph. over Fb bar, which is denoted by, so, G, P, L, or sometimes also G, uh, I think, uh, G, 2, G, L, FP bar, okay? These are two different notations, so let me write or, or. Okay, is denoted, is defined as, is defined as the graph with. Okay, so we have to, we have a graph, we have to define the set of vertices and the set of edges, right? So which are our vertices? So what uh, would you like to say by looking at this graph? Of course you don't know, but, uh, or maybe you've heard about it, so. Exactly, it's like, it seems like an ex uh, the extension, this, the quadratic extension at P, right? It's exactly true. But I'm going to, you know, to define them, we want also elliptic curves, so we will understand how we will arrive there. So our vertices, I denoted the, the, this set V, is actually the set of FP bar isomorphism classes of super singular elliptic curves over FP bar. Ah, you can tell me I don't see any elliptic curve, and you, you would be right, but uh, actually we are going to label each one of these classes with some elements of FP squared, okay? So basically they are super single elliptic curves up to isomorphism. And what are our edges? Our edges are isogenies, okay? But not all kind of isogenies. We're going to take only isogenies of fixed degree, of degree L, up to some equivalence. That I'm going to tell you later, up to some equivalence. Okay. Our vertices are super single elliptic curves, our maps are isogenies of fixed degree equal to L. So when you see there an edge, a green edge, basically that is an isogeny of degree L, of degree two in our case. Okay, but in order to understand a little bit about these vertices, we have to, you know, we have to do some math. So set of vertices, Because actually, we would like to, to start from here and arrive to elements in FP squared, right? So we have to understand how this uh, isomorphism between elliptic curves, they work. So let me give this uh, definition first. So what does it mean that two elliptic curves are isogenies? So, uh, are isomorphic, sorry. So two elliptic curves, E1, E2, I will 
state this in more in general, so over k, but you can always replace this with a finite field. So defined, defined over k are said to be isomorphic over k and respectively over the algebraic closure of k if there exists an isomorphism what is an isomorphism we saw this yesterday isogeny of degree 1 isogeny of degree 1 defined over k or respectively over k bar which stands basically between from e1 to e2 okay and clearly in this case There exists also an isomorphism phi phi minus one from E two to E one, and when I compose phi with phi minus one, I get the identity. On E2. Okay, definition of isomorphism, like you know, the only different thing is that now they are not just isomorphism of groups, but also like uh, um, isomorphism as rational functions. Okay, let's do an example here. Okay, any questions so far? Over K it means that this map has coefficients in K. Yes, are polynomial with coefficients in K. Over K bar, it means that uh, you may have some coefficients over the, uh, like, uh, some extension. So if it is defined over F K bar, it is defined over K, but not the converse, okay? In, ge in general, we consider isomorphism over K bar in this kind of application, okay? So let's do some examples. Actually, just one example. I want to show you the two elliptic curves with two different Weierstrass equations can be actually isomorphic. Okay? So let us take E1 defined by y squared equal x cubed plus 2x plus 27. And then let's, let's take E2 given by y square equal x cubed plus 42 x plus 1. And we consider them over the finite field with 47 elements. So the question is, are they isomorphic? Well, the answer is yes. So E1 is isomorphic to E2. And actually, we can explicitly write, you will have an exercise also later about this. You can explicitly write this, uh, this isomorphism. So phi sends the point xy on E1 into the point 16x minus 17y. You can check that actually given a point on E1, this is a point on E2, 
And you see this is a an isomorphism because everything here is of degree one. Okay, so in particular, we're saying that the degree we can read it here, this is a, a, a rational function because a polynomial of degree one. And we can also write phi minus one So you are looking for the map that composing with that basically gives you x, y. And uh, you can easily find this. It is 3x, 11, y. Okay? So you see, two different, uh, two different uh, Weierstrass uh, equations are actually correspond to isomorphic elliptic curves. And uh, it is good to know that whenever you work with uh, elliptic curves in this easy form, your isomorphisms are also very easy. So let me write this here. So all the isomorphisms Ah, so sorry, here is I1. Sorry, E1. Thank you very much. All the isomorphisms between two elliptic curves defined over K and in short bias transform. are of the form so xy that we send the point xy in the point u square x u cubed y where u is an element of the algebraic closure of k so this element can be in k but in general, so all these homomorphisms here, we can write defined over k bar, are defined in this way. And basically here you are sending the elliptic curve with equation x y squared equal x cubed plus ax plus b into the curve with equation y squared equal x cubed plus a u4 x plus b b u to the 6. Okay? So, in our case, for instance, here, if you check very easily, so here u square has to be 4, so it can be u equal to 4 or minus 4, right? And actually, for having here that u cubed it is equal to minus 17, here you have that u is actually minus 4. You can easily check this for this example. And actually you can see that starting from the, cur the elliptic curve E1, the elliptic curve E2 is of this form where the coefficients, the new coefficients here can be computed like that. Minus 4? Well, because uh, then you, are, you need to have that uh, u cubed uh, it's equal to uh, minus 17. And uh, uh, 4 cubed is uh, 64, so it has to be uh, negative for getting minus 17, right? Okay, so the question now here, you see, still it's kind of complicated to decide whether two elliptic curves are uh, isomorphic. So the question is, is there an easier way to check whether two elliptic curves in short bias transform are isomorphic. And of course, if I ask this question, the answer is yes. And uh, so we are going to introduce um, a quantity that can be assigned to any elliptic curves, which really captures the isomorphism uh, class of the elliptic curve. Uh, no, no, 
but I, I, you know, I want to, imagine I give you just this, can you do an easy computation to say, ah, yes, they are ectomorphic, okay? So when we don't have to take any exogeny, just looking at the equation. So such kind of quantity that uh, stays the same for uh, Isomorphic class is called invariant, and in our case it's called J invariant. So definition, let E an elliptic curve in short via transform with uh, A and B in K. Okay, the J invariant, so it means that it is invariant by isomorphisms, so the J invariant of E is defined as, okay, so let's denote it J of E. So you have always to remember this number when you work with isogeny. 17, 28, okay? Wait, 17, 28 times, and now of course we want something in function of A and B, and we will have four A cubed over four A cubed plus 27 B squared. Oh, we have seen already this quantity. The discriminant that had to be non-zero, so that this is actually defined. And so now imagine that these elements are all elements A and B, they are elements of a field, so you can invert, multiply, and everything. So where does this uh, J invariant, uh, to what set, to, what, to where does it belong to? It is an element of K, right? Everything is in K, so we are still in K. So you have to do, you know, this computation is more, if you work modulo P, also this computation is modulo P. Yes? Uh, minus four because we wanted that, here you wanted that 16 is equal U square and minus 17 is equal U cubed for this reason. So if 16 is equal U square, U can be 4 or minus 4. But 4 doesn't work because 4 cubed is 64 and you would get 17 modulo 47. Right? Yes. Um, so you have to take the other uh, solution to this. So minus 4. Okay, so with the following two things, we're going to understand why in isogeny based cryptography we like to work with super thin elliptic curves. This is not the case in the cryptography that we do we use nowadays, because super thin elliptic curves are not secure with respect to the discrete logarithm problem. Okay, so you see these problems are very different. Whether now, actually, we actually prefer super thin elliptic curves, and they have these very nice properties. So, first of all, let me say something that is true, you know, like, because we have, we have written this, but we didn't understand the relationship with isomorphism. So, very important fact, two elliptic curves defined over K, so two elliptic curves, let's us call E1 and E2, defined over K, are isomor isomorphic over K bar, okay? If and only if, the J invariants are the same. So 
before, I could take, for answering the question if they are isomorphic, the two equations, I could compute for each one of them the J invariant. If I got, I get the same thing, they are isomorphic, otherwise, no. This is important over K bar, okay? This is important. Not over K. Over K is a slightly over K bar. So this is the first thing. Second thing, let, let, let's now understand what happened with super singular elliptic curve. So let E be a super singular. elliptic curve over some algebra defined over some algebraic extension of fp then e is always isomorphic to an elliptic curve E prime defined by a short Weierstrass equation like this. And this we knew already. But when we work with super thin elliptic curve, we actually know that these coefficients a and b, they are in a quadratic extension of fp, in fp square. And therefore, so then E is isomorphic to E, and for this reason, since they have the same J invariant, and the J invariant of this is in FP square, also the J invariant of the starting curve belongs to FP square. Okay? So when we work with super thin elliptic curve, we can always find a model which is defined over a quadratic extension of fp. And because of this, the j invariant is always an element of fp square. So this is why, in our previous graph, so imagine that this is a complete set of representatives of isomorphic classes of super single elliptic curves over fp bar, okay? This is how we defined. So we defined our vertices as uh, isomorphic classes, and we can take for every isomorphic class is a representative. And now, for each one, I'll just compute the J invariant. So basically, I'm labeling every isomorphic class by its J invariant, okay? And this now is a subset of fp square. So that's why before all the vertices were, yes? So my question was that previously you had stated that uh, you were taking this value, g of fp, that is the same value, which belongs in k. Yes. Uh, let's say we are working with f of t in general. That would imply that it belongs in f of t, right? Well, if the curve is defined over f of p, yes. It will be in FP. And indeed, you remember before, so this is our graph. So these J invariants here are of group of curves defined over FP. Okay? But these are of curves defined over FP, FP squared minus FP. They don't have all the coefficients over FP squared. Right? So this is uh, the, the idea. Because uh, you can always uh, find a model defined over FP squared. But uh, if there are some coefficients which do not belong to FP, then the J invariant uh, will not go, will not be in FP. Okay? J oh, is the same. They are the same because they are isomorphic. Uh, 
right? So, but what was is important for us is that for any elliptic curve, super singular, the J invariance in a, is in SP squared. Sorry? Oh, okay, of course, yes. They are they have to be defined over the same field. Or you can take a, like a, No, I, I mean, I mean, like, like, so if if E prime is defined over SP bar, SP square is also defined over SP bar. So you can bring them to be defined over the same field. Okay. Okay. So is it clear that our set of edges is, of, of vertices how it's defined? Basically, now you can always re recall that they are elements in SP square that actually are the J invariant of our elliptic curves. Now let us understand a little bit better what is the set of edges, okay? Because here it is, this is a little bit more like uh, um, maybe complicated to understand and uh, there are maybe also different definitions, but we are going to take this one. So I will erase here so that I have more space. So two isogenies, I want to say when they are equivalent. So two isogenies, so let's call it uh, phi and psi from E to E prime are equivalent if and only if Actually, I can obtain one from the other. So phi is actually obtained from psi by com post-composing, we say, by an automorphism. U composed psi. So for some, U that belongs to the set of automorphism of uh, E prime. Okay, so don't give up. I'm going to, you know, like, uh, um, let's try to understand this more. So, because, uh, let, let us do a remark. Okay, we, we saw already what, is, what are some automorphism. So, for every elliptic curve, such that, Actually, the J invariant is different from 0 and 1728. These are always considered particular J invariants. For every elliptic curve such that this is true, you actually have that the set of automorphism is trivial. Like, it's trivial, it's uh, uh, not trivial. It's just uh, composed by 1, so the identity, and minus one, okay? We've seen that uh, one and minus one, they are always uh, isomorphisms that are also endomorphisms, okay? And when, is, when actually you take an elliptic curve with J invariant zero, then we always say that there are some extra automorphisms And we know exactly how much they are, they are six. And for the other case, so if the J invariant is equal 17, 28, then the set of automorphism is equal to four. Okay? Well, this is more difficult to understand, but I, I want just to show you in the picture what happens. So, 
you see, if you look at this graph, what you would uh, notice uh, some properties, some you would like to say something, we're going to write them down, but uh, you know, for a, so you have to understand that this is, uh, this is zero, okay, and, uh, and this, uh, they are particular edges, okay? So you see, everywhere else, uh, it is very regular. If you count the number of edges, uh, we have three, three, okay? Apart there, that happens something particular. And basically, this is due because, uh, like, uh, we have this, the, uh, this extra automorphism that make a problem. I don't, uh, you know, I, I cannot pretend that you understand this uh, completely now, but keep this in mind, okay? The question also is, uh, why, you know, these edges are undirected? So why if I have, so why the graph it is undirected? So it seems that if there is an exogeny in one way, then we have also an exogeny on the other way. So that we say these two things are the same, and then uh, you know uh, we can just consider this as an undirected edge. And this is actually the uh, the case. This other exogeny is called the dual exogeny. So definition. So if we have phi from E1 to E2, an isogeny of degree D, the dual isogeny is, okay, this is kind of a proposition as well, is the unique isogeny denoted by phi tilde, which goes from, uh, in the other direction, so from, from E2 to E1, such that it verifies this property. When I compose phi dual with phi, I get the multiplication by D where D is the degree of the exogeny. This is how it is defined, okay? I take an exogeny of degree D, there is always a dual exogeny here also of degree D. The, the dual exogeny, is, sorry, is the unique exogeny of degree D as well. That goes in the other direction and satisfy the thing that when we compose, we're actually multiplying by an integer, okay? So you have to imagine here this kind of drawing. So E1, E2, I have an isogeny phi. I have another isogeny here, phi dual, okay? And you see, when you compose them, you get an endomorphism, no? Because this is a map from E1 to itself. And this endomorphism is the multiplication by D, the map that at every point associates D times that point. Okay, a lot of notions, I know, but this at least allows us to understand a little bit better this kind of object. Question? Uh, and the other has to be equal to one, right? Yeah, 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 it's, it's true, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, those, do you, do you remember yesterday we brought down two curves and uh, uh, we said that these are super singular for when P congruent to two modulo three or P congruent to three modulo four? 
these are the two, the two cores, one of J invariant 0 and the other one of J invariant 17, 28. So those are very particular cores for, because we know a lot about them. Uh, yes, this is a... Yeah, but uh, uh, is it true that uh, you, you don't need the other to be necessarily one? Uh, so you have 4a cubed over 4a cubed plus 27b squared. So if b is, 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 uh, is 0, then you get 17a. But uh, if, uh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, then yes, yes, okay, yes, yes. And then when you take uh, uh, the other equal to 1, you get the easiest form. Okay. Okay, so this is all the theory about super single isogeny graph, but... Uh, Let's try to gather some properties. So properties of GPL. Okay, first of all, an interesting information would be to know how big are these graphs, how many vertices. So we say that the number of vertices is exponential in log p because we know exactly how many vertices. So exponentially, is exponentially large because there are approximately, so uh, because the number of the cardinality of V, the number of uh, vertices, we know it exactly, you know, how much is that. So it depends on, uh, it depends on some congruence modularity, but basically it is P over 12. Let us do this here, okay? Let us count how many vertices. One, two, three, four, five, six, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Can you do 227 divided by 12? I will do it. 227 divided by 12. We get 18 as low for 18 something. So 18, let, let us recall this. And so our number is 18 plus 2, okay? The number of vertices in our case. Because uh, the formula is the, uh, the following one, is the, uh, square, the, the floor of P, over two, of P over 12 plus 0, 1, or 2. And this depends on the congruence, the... the, the modular, how to say, the congruence class of P. So if P is congruent to 1 modulo 12, 1 if P is congruent to 5, 7 modulo 12, and if P is congruent to 11 modulo 12, okay? And I think that if we do 18 times uh, how much, uh, uh, 12, we get uh, uh, 216, so it is actually we are in this case, okay? So the number of vertices is uh, 20, which is 18, so this part plus 2 because we are in this case, okay? So we know exactly how many vertices so there are in this graph. Then, other thing, well, these are all the vertices, and you see that the graph is connected. So this is not a coincidence. The graph is connected. There is a question? Sorry? Yes, you multiply the degree. If you compose the degree here, you know, so the composition of this is, a, uh, is an isogeny of degree d square, which is actually the degree of every multiplication by, by D. 
Yes, like yesterday we saw the multiplication by 2. And it had degree 4, which is 2 squared. Like this, D is, a, is an isogeny of degree D squared. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, every integer you can see as an endomorphism, actually, you know? Is a, you can associate to the integer the multiplication by that integer. Yes? Well, because of 1 and minus 1, they are, uh, they are isogenies of degree 1, which are also endomorphisms, so they are endo automorphisms. Okay? So it is connected with diameter. Okay? So the diameter tells us basically the maximum distance between two vertices. So this diameter is, uh, is logarithmic in P. So with diameter of size log p, okay? And then another thing that we can actually see from, uh, uh, we noted before from this picture that uh, you know, this is a kind of regular graph. What is the degree of regularity? How many edges are from each tree, right? And three is two plus one. So in general, for an L isogeny graph, the degree is L plus one. So, just a second. Yes. Why this? Uh, because uh, uh, when it's congruent, what happens when it's congruent? There is a, like, when it's congruent to three uh, modulo. Well, then it is not a prime, right? So it is a multiple of three, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is not a prime when it's congruent to 3 in modulo 4. It's equal to 12. Yes, that is the reason. Okay, so it has plus 1 regular, but we saw with some exception. So except possibly at j equals 0 and j equals 17, 28, because well, take it like this for the moment because of the extra automorphism. Actually, you know, here I made all this undirected, but it actually has a, a, like an orientation here and here, okay? It's a little bit delicate. I don't want to go inside this, but imagine that uh, it's... Uh, it's L plus one regular, and this is the case, so there are no exceptions. So there are no exceptions when P is congruent to one modulo 12. Because when P is one modulo 12, neither zero, neither 17, 28 are super singular because we saw yesterday those two kind of curves. So in this, in this case, uh, neither one or neither the other are super similar, so they are not in the graph. And finally, I will go back to this because then we're going to do some exercises and it's important to understand where this L plus one comes from, okay? But first, let, let me write the last property, which is what is important for the CGL hash function. And this was the reason why, actually, these graphs were used in, uh, um, for, for uh, cryptographic uh, uh, purposes. So it is a Ramanujan graph. OK? 
ok? So, Ramanujan graphs, they have like a formal definition in terms of eigenvalues. Uh, maybe, you know, you know, if there are people working graph theory, you know better this than me. But, uh, so, actually they are optimal expander graph. And what this means is that if you take a kind of short walk in the graph, start, you start from a point. You start, you, you walk a little bit, you actually, uh, you know, the, the, the end point of your walk approximates the uniform distribution. So you don't know anymore where you are in the graph. So we say also that they have very good mixing properties. Because I start from a vertex, I do a, a short walk, and I don't know anymore where I am in the graph. Okay, so let's write this. So the end point so this can be written very precisely in terms of probability, but uh, just for uh, make it uh, a little bit more uh, uh, so roughly speaking, let's say, so the end point of a random walk approximates the uniform distribution after, so actually we have to take just a, a walk of the length equal to the diameter after big O of log P steps. So this is what, this is really important for cryptography. So important for cryptography. Any questions so far? Sorry, Ramanujan graph? Yeah. No, we didn't do, a, we didn't give a definition. But it means, imagine that I fix a vertex here, and I do a walk of log two, log of p, okay? No, I don't know exactly how much is that. You can compute it, okay? Maybe it is, uh, well, I don't want to say two, uh, 256, uh, how much is uh, two, 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 the? Uh, five, six, seven, eight. So it's more or less two to the eight, okay? Right? So when you have to do the computation uh, live, uh, it's more <laughs> like stressing, okay? So you take a walk of eight steps. So one, two, three, four, five, six, eight. The idea is that now I land it here, but if I now take another one from here, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight. I, and basically, I can reach every point of the graph, and uh, you know the end point uh, approximate the, uni the, the uniform distribution. It's like uh, you know picking a random point from the graph when you do that. Okay, this is the idea. Is it more clear? Okay, the reward you can ask me later. Uh, uh, like Ramanujan graph, they are optimal expander graphs. I, I think it is like, do you need here a definition with eigenvalues? Sorry, I don't, it's not really, I don't remember now all these uh, definitions, but maybe for people they know this. Well, we can discuss about this later, okay? So that we check the definitions together, okay? If I'm wrong, I will tell you tomorrow, okay? So.
We'll see this later. We will see this later. So the last thing I want to do, so that tomorrow we, we can actually describe this uh, hash function. I want to explain this because, uh, because uh, explaining this will allow also you to construct isogeny graphs. And actually an exercise of uh, uh, later, if you want to do it, is to build an isogeny graph for a specific uh, prime uh, p and uh, a specific value of l, okay? By using some, some uh, software, okay? We, we cannot do it by hand. Or at least, it, it will take a lot of time. So, some remarks on the L plus one regularity. Okay? Because we want to try to understand a little bit why we have, uh, for every vertex, like L plus one edges, okay? So, let us, let us try to understand what happens. Imagine that we have, so let phi from E1 to E2 be an isogeny of prime degree L which is different from the characteristic of our field. Okay? So, the fact of being an isogeny of prime degree L, this implies, first of all, that phi is separable. Because basically the degree, you know, normally inseparable isogenies, you get them by composing with the Frobenius where there is a power of P, right? So, but this degree is, a pri is prime and different from P, so this cannot be the case. So this is separable. And what did we say for, about the kernel for phi separable? So what do we know about the kernel? when uh, the isogeny is separable. What is the number of elements? Is equal to the degree, okay? So this is a finite subgroup, so it's a subgroup with L elements, L is a prime. So what does it mean? Subgroups with order, with cardinality of prime number are cyclic, right? So care D5 is a cyclic, cyclic subgroup of order L of order L. And actually, you agree with me that uh, every point here will have order L as well. Or, at, you know, a, a divisor of L, one or L, okay? So in particular, we are saying that the kernel is a subgroup of, is a subgroup, let us revise it, it's a subgroup of the L torsion subgroup EDL of order L, okay? So we started with an isogeny of prime degree and we got that this isogeny, the kernel of this isogeny needs to be a subgroup of the L torsion subgroup of order L. So now if we know the structure of EL, 
we can say more about these subgroups. So this, when L is different from P, okay, because both are primes, okay, is actually isomorphic to the abstract group So the, to the Cartesian product of these two cyclic group, okay? So this means actually that my l torsion subgroup is generated by two linearly independent points, P and Q, okay? And now it is possible actually to write down all the subgroups of order L of this kind of group. So therefore, the l torsion subgroup has L plus one subgroups of order L. And they are Define like this, P plus A times Q. So they are the subgroup generated by these points for A equals zero, L minus one, and the subgroup generated by the point Q. Okay? So I want to, a little bit to sum up what I just said. We have some music. Uh, what did we prove here? If I have an isogeny of prime degree L, this, the kernel is actually something like this, where P and Q are the generator of the L torsion stack. You will do later an exercise, you will understand this better, okay? So, because when we will do an exercise with L equal to and trying to work on this, okay? So, it, it would be actually nice to be able to build isogenies by giving a specific tag group. I mean, I, imagine that they want to build isogeny with a kernel the subgroup generated by a given point. Can, do I do that? So the answer is yes. Yes. So these are two points. So what are they? They are points here, which means, so this is defined, I remember, the points, uh, let me call them R. In FP bar, such that L times R equal the identity. Okay? Are the points that when you multiply by L, you get the identity. Yes, L torsion. It is necessary what? I didn't understand just, sorry, I didn't hear. Well, this is, a, this is something that, uh, you know, you have to prove as well, okay, yes. But I promise I give you all the references for everything I didn't prove, okay? So let me state this theorem and then we comment it together. And tomorrow we try to put this all together to understand how, you know, why we did this. So let us, so let E over K be an elliptic curve. And let G be a finite 
सब ग्रुप ऑफ द सेट ऑफ के बार रेशनल पॉइंट देन देर एग्जिस्ट an elliptic curve e prime and a separable isogeny phi from e to e prime okay so what we did so far we take an elliptic curve we take a finite subgroup of the set of k bar rational points i'm telling you that there exists an isogeny which is exactly that kernel g as a kernel okay so there exists an analytic and a separable isogeny with kernel phi equal to g okay and to be precise this isogeny is not uh, this uh, like uh, this curve and this isogeny are not complete are not unique but they are unique up to isomorphism and what i'm writing, writing uh, now so the curve e prime is unique up to isomorphism and the isogeny phi is unique up to post composition with an isomorphism an automorphism okay okay what it means all this uh, example I have an elliptic curve, okay? And I want to construct an isogeny, let's say, of degree 2, okay? The thing before tells me that uh, the kernel of this isogeny is a subgroup of the two torsion subgroup, okay? And here we saw, maybe in an exercise, I don't know if you did, that uh, this has cardinality 4, okay? Th we have the identity, and then we have three points, which are the, you remember, the two torsion points, the intersection with the x-axis, uh, P1, P2, and P3, okay? So this is a subgroup of order 2 of this, so basically, every point here defines a different subgroup. So we have three different subgroups. So I can take that one generate P1, P2, and P3. So three possibilities. And if I choose any one of these, I can actually find this, uh, the isogeny with kernel this one. You will see this also yeah, on the software. And actually, the way like to, to uh, the formulas for, uh, for uh, writing down explicitly, explicitly these uh, elliptic curves and this isogeny are due to value. Don't, so explicit formulas that 
due to value. And today we will start from, from here for, the, for uh, understanding these formulas better and to understand how the, the CGL fun, hash function works. And we will go back to this in the exercise. So now it is a little bit, a lot of information. So I think that, uh, anyway, the time is over. We will work this later with the exercise. And uh, meanwhile, do, I, do we have any questions? I guess you're a little bit lost at the end. I understand this was more uh, difficult. But I promise you that later with the exercise, we understand it better, OK? So if there are no questions, uh, so we can uh, and, uh, and then we leave the question for later. Thank you. <laughs>